Hey everyone, this is Ben. Welcome to the Tinnitus Virtual Summit. We are here today with a special guest all the way from Colorado in the United States, Fort Collins, Colorado to be exact. This is Dr. Natalie Phillips, who is a doctor of audiology. Hi, Natalie. How are you doing today? Hi, good. Good to see you. Yes, we're so happy to have you here. So Dr. Phillips has served on the board of directors for the Colorado Academy of Audiology, and she's been providing tinnitus and sound sensitivity therapy options to patients for the last 20 years. So I wanted to bring her on for the virtual summit to explain a bit about what someone with tinnitus can expect working with a doctor of audiology. How are you doing today, Natalie? Want to share a bit about your experience working with tinnitus and sound sensitivity therapy? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, working with patients with tinnitus and sound sensitivity, it's been a really, really fun thing. It's one of my favorite things I love to do because you see a huge change in people that may not have had the ability to have that hope, you know, and, and so people that are tuning in, I, first of all, start looking at the whole picture. So I have to look at whether or not a patient has hearing loss, tinnitus, and sound sensitivity. So there are three things I'm looking for. So it's not just a tinnitus patient um, or a, a hearing loss patient. And then they kind of get categorized, but at the same time, you cannot, you cannot ever categorize a tinnitus patient when they walk in their do your door. There's nobody like the other person that you've just seen, you know? And so knowing that, those three different things that I look at with hearing loss, tinnitus, and sound sensitivity. Some of the reasons why you have to look at the whole picture is because you might have somebody, for example, with a hearing loss that has tinnitus and maybe it's constant, but it's not super bothersome for them. So depending on their questionnaires, depending on how we rank them, they fall into a category of, it's possible that amplification might actually help you in this particular situation without even going into tinnitus therapy. And so with that, we do our regular tests, we do our different um, questionnaires, and then it helps me decide whether or not they want to do it. So to back up, there has been a research that was done, and I don't know if you um, know about the Heller and Bergman research, but there are researchers that took normal hearing people put them in an audio booth and said, whenever you hear something, push this button. So it sounded like a hearing test. And these normal hearing people walked in and sat there and did not present, and the researchers did not present anything. After a while, 94% of those patients started to push the button. So when they walked outside, they said, describe to us what you heard. And people said, huh, I heard a whooshing, ringing, you know, humming, buzzing, Katie did's crickets, the ocean, music, everything that we describe as tinnitus. So they proved two things in that research. Number one, Normal hearing people can have tinnitus, so it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with your ears. The second thing they proved is that when you're put in a quiet environment, your brain starts to pick up on softer level sounds that are occurring all the time. And so most people that start to notice tinnitus, they can um, notice it maybe when they first wake up in the morning or when they first go to bed at night. So, or maybe when they're working at home with social distancing, whatever, you know, quieter environments, your brain is able, gonna, able to pick up on tinnitus. And so going back to just the hearing loss patient, you might have hearing loss and that's your quiet environment. And so just by giving you amplification alone might actually allow your brain to not notice the tinnitus during the day and then you don't focus on it. And so over time, by the time you remove your hearing aids at night, you might not need anything at night, but it also depends. So walking into, you know, that's the first thing is the hearing loss. The tinnitus is the next question. If the tinnitus is more bothersome than just, you know, noticing it here and there, you might actually need tinnitus therapy. And so walking through that realm, you know, doing some different tests and, and getting the ranking of where your tinnitus is, then might put you into a category of treating you for hearing loss and for tinnitus or just for tinnitus. And so it's really important to try to figure that out. Now the third one, the sound sensitivity is important to look at because if you have sound sensitivity at all, whether it is hyperacusis, whether it's misophonia, and I can talk about those terms um, if, you know, if you want to, but if you have sound sensitivity and you have tinnitus or hearing loss, I can't even treat you for tinnitus and hearing loss unless I get rid of your sound sensitivity first. So that is super important. So when I look at 
a patient that walks in my door, whether they're scheduled for tinnitus, sound sensitivity, hearing loss with some tinnitus, I have to look at all those three things. And so walking into my office as an audiologist, I look at the whole picture to decide whether or not, you know, they actually need my services for full on tinnitus or do they just need a hearing aid or can I help them with sound sensitivity? So that's where I start with my patients. Thank you. And in my understanding, you also work with an ear, nose, throat physician very closely. Mm -hmm. And how does that normally happen if I'm someone who comes to your clinic because I have tinnitus, I'm looking for some answers. I would see you for the hearing test first. And then what would happen? Would I see an ear, nose, throat physician? Yep, absolutely. So depending. So a couple of things. The relationship that I have with the ear, nose, and throat physician that we work together we have a really good trust factor. So a couple of things can happen. If we get a referral from a primary care physician and they come in and they see me first, and it's a really cut and dry, you know, um, type of uh, situation where it's a hearing loss with some tinnitus, there's no asymmetry, there's no hearing, uh, there's no ear pain, there's no um, dizziness, anything like that. There's no one-sided tinnitus. The tinnitus doesn't sound like a heartbeat. I can easily move forward and say, hey, you can see the ENT for this, but you probably don't need to. It's totally up to you. We can schedule your appointment right here and there, or we can continue to walk down that route. I will send reports back to your primary care physician, and then they just work with me. But if it is something that I see medically, now I have been in a medical audiology world, though, for many, many years, um, and it's something that is a red flag to me, or it's just really questionable, it's super easy for that patient to be scheduled with the ENT. The ENT role is then to do their medical evaluation but they send them right back to us. They know, hey, we're not the tinnitus experts. We're not the hearing aid experts. You go and see our doctors of audiology because they're the ones that are going to be able to help you out with this. But they are able to rule out, order some further testing if we need to, whether it's a medical condition or not. So sometimes it's a choice. Sometimes if it's a red flag, we send them on for that. Absolutely. And most patients who end up at the ear, nose, throat doctor, they're looking at, okay, what can they actually do? Well, there's, there's no procedure, there's no pill that's going to stop the tinnitus. And then they would be sent back to the audiologist to discuss what's the hearing level, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of therapies have you used over the years that have improved the lives of tinnitus patients? So I started looking into tinnitus therapy um, 20 years ago when, when I first started doing this. And it was interesting because at the time, there was not really a certification process to be uh, able to treat tinnitus. And still, there really isn't a certification process. So a fellow audiologist and I really wanted to delve into, well, let's look at the research. Let's see what's out there and what has the best success. And at the time, 20 years ago, tinnitus retraining therapy was one of the only things out there that had a high success rate that was replicable. And um, since then, there have been other things that have come out, but um, they've kind of fluctuated. And, and tinnitus retraining therapy has been around since the 1980s for people that didn't know that. And it still has a very high success rate, whether or not, um, but I have found out that you have to follow the protocol pretty much to the T um, and be motivated to be able to do that. So I stick with tinnitus retraining therapy um, that ha I've been using since, you know, for the past 20 years. It also has protocols that I have seen that work with sound sensitivity issues. And that's huge because a lot of protocols out there now that come out for tinnitus patients don't necessarily look in that sound sensitivity realm and that's huge to look at and so the the protocols within TRT the umbrella of tinnitus retraining therapy their protocols have worked so my sound sensitivity patients have improved anywhere from as little as a week up to three months and that's about an average of getting rid of their sound sensitivity completely so that we can move on to treat their tinnitus or their hearing loss um, some of the other protocols that I've seen that have come out, um, not as fast. And uh, I mean, we're, I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs, waiting for their sound sensitivity to improve in order for me to get further. Um, so tennis retraining therapy is, is my go-to. But I have also looked and worked with Neuromonics, uh, which is a device that came out in 2005. And then also SoundCure, which I don't believe they are still in practice right now. So those are kind of the ones that I've dabbled in. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Neuromonics, it's a device on the ears that is programmed based on the hearing levels, the thresholds from the hearing test. Do you feel 
like the popularity of neuromonics has decreased or stayed the same or increased over time? And if so, why? So it's interesting because I was kind of on the um, boat initially with neuromonics. Like I wasn't going to look into it. So I didn't look into it right as soon as it came out in 2005. In fact, they were knocking on my door to try it out. And I was like, no, there's no way that tinnitus retraining therapy takes 12 to 18 months of therapy, 24 hours of sound. And now you're giving me a device that's based on the neurophysiological model of tinnitus, just like tinnitus retraining therapy. But now you're saying, you know, two to four hours a day, six to eight months of therapy. So I took a, I was very skeptical and I'm like that with every single tinnitus um, protocol that comes out. And so it took me a while to look into it. When I finally looked into it, I understood how it worked um, because of the different uh, music that overlies it. And it took off, you know, it took off for me. I had some great results with it. Um, and there was only one device at the time. It was their Oasis device. But then more and more audiologists were interested in, um, in treating tinnitus. And again, this is just my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so Neuromonics came out with other devices. They came out with devices, the Haven and the Sanctuary. And they were devices that were less expensive for patients so that audiologists could then dispense them easier for patients because they were at a lesser price point. But the biggest difference between the two that came out after their first initial one is that when you do neuromonics therapy, there are usually two phases. There's an active phase where your tinnitus is being worked on, and then there's one where they slowly habituate you in a desensitization phase, and that's phase two. And that way they remove a broadband noise so that your brain can now make its own corrections on its own. And so the biggest difference when they release their two other devices, the Haven and the Sanctuary, is that neither of them had the second phase. And so in order to provide long-term effects for patients, to me, I never touched those two products because it was one of those products that an audiologist could give to a tinnitus patient and say, here, use, use this as needed. And there's not a lot of research on it, except for the fact that people get some immediate relief. And what I explain to my patients is we could do it, but I'm telling you, there's not the second phase. And I look for long-term results in my patients. I don't want you to have immediate relief. I want you to, yes, have immediate relief, but I also want you to retrain your brain to get back to where it's supposed to be. And so I always just use the Oasis device. I don't know if that was their downfall. I'm not too sure um, or not, but I feel like once they came out, they weren't as successful. Like you didn't see the result that you did with their first device. I think possibly because of the second phase. And because of that, I think the audiologists that were getting involved in it then probably didn't keep up with it as much because there was not that same um, effective 96% of a 40% reduction that they were putting out in their literature. And so I think that with neuromonics, that might have been a little bit harder for them to keep up with the three devices with the audiologists that wanted to do it. Um, and then there was a little bit of a device fail. There were a lot of turnovers in the company, some device fail failures. But I know that they came out again um, with uh, something new with an app, you know, um, a, a different device. And I think that they're slowly climbing again. Um, I have not actually gone down that route again of looking into neuromonics um, since their device fails because I um, had a hard time um, having my patients work and then have breaks in their therapy and then wait for their device and then have it fixed and then work again. And so in that downtime, I went back to tinnitus retraining therapy for all my patients and it continued to work. And so I think that the rise and fall that you saw might have been because of that. Um, but I, it's possible that they're kind of rising up again um, with what they're doing, but I'm not really too sure because I don't do them uh, as, as often. Yeah, thank you. It seems that your foundation working with tinnitus patients has been tinnitus retraining therapy, which is one of the most commonly used methods for good reason because of the research and the evidence to back it up. Uh, what are your comments on every, every, so every few years, it seems that there's a new tinnitus product that comes and it has a lot of excitement and in the community, there's a lot of hope. And what's your advice to a tinnitus patient, someone with, someone with tinnitus out there who might be watching this, who, over the last number of years, they've saw different products come. What's your advice about how to monitor that, how to establish the credibility of, of a new offer in the 
in the online world or from an audiologist even, and then how to monitor that over time to make sure it's, it's reliable. Yeah. You know, that's, that's such a good question because I think even as an audiologist, I think it's hard for us to figure that out. And like I said, I go through everything that comes out with a, with a fine tooth comb. If I have to call the CEO, I call the CEO and we hash it out because there are a lot of things that come out. So the number one thing that I would say, whether you're a patient or professional, when you're looking at some of these new things coming out is look at the research, look at who's doing the research, you know, if it's a peer reviewed type of research or if it's other people outside of the company that are doing the research that put that out. And so that's why I normally don't jump in right away because it's a lot of research that was done within the company and I wait to see what has been done outside. So that's number one is probably ask for a white paper or the research or talk to somebody at the company that knows, you know, if you can, if you have that status and you can get to it. I know a lot of patients, they don't have that ability to do that. So maybe reach out to an audiologist, but maybe a tinnitus specialist audiologist that can do that legwork for you if you are a consumer or a patient, because you might not be able to have that direct line to that company, but audiologists sure can, because we're the ones that have to do that in order to provide that to our patients. So number one is looking at the research. Number two, you have to sometimes just try it out. You know, unfortunately, it might work, it might not work. And that's with a lot of tinnitus um, things that are out there. You know, I used to, part of my intake was I had a form and I had a form that had every single thing that was out there that said that helped tinnitus and I had people check it off because I was interested to see what they tried mm -hmm. and the reason why I had 50 things on my sheet was because there are things out there that help some people but they don't help everybody right and so they have to be documented and they have to be put out there but people have to try it and so even though I mostly stay with tinnitus retraining therapy. And I've got a patient that comes in and says, well, what do you think about this? Should I try that? I never say, no, it's not going to work. Don't do it. You know, I always say, you know what? Try it. You never know. You never know with your, the way your body reacts to different things, you know, the way that your brain is reacting to different things. You need to at least try it out and see if it works. Just have an open mind, try it out. It might be complementary to what we're doing. It might take you to that next level so that stuff that I am doing works better. You know, if you want to try it out, go ahead and try it out. So that would be the second thing. So research, I guess, would be first. Second thing would be you have to try it out. And unfortunately, you have to, you know, fail or fail fast. Um, or maybe it might actually work and it would be great if it did. Um, and then I guess uh, thirdly is kind of going back to the expert, you know, as a consumer, as a patient, um, try to find an audiologist that is really passionate about tinnitus. I think that's important. There's so many audiologists that um, do tinnitus because, you know, it's kind of interesting and I bet you that might bring me in a lot of hearing aid sales. I don't know, but maybe. That's another thing that I can add to my repertoire. But they don't necessarily have the passion to work with tinnitus and sound sensitivity patients. And I don't want to, um, to throw anybody under the bus, but at the same time, you know, um, the reason why tinnitus patients are some of my favorite is because I get to know them really well. I get to know, you know, what's going on in their lives, you know, um, psychologically too. And, and I never give advice psychologically, but it is interesting because you have to get into their brains to understand why something's working and why something's not working and maybe their stress levels. And yes, they are, um, you know, they do show up on your doorstep a lot more than other patients. And so you have to have that patience, but you also have to have that passion and that motivation to know that what you're doing as an audiologist is going to help them. And so if you can find that particular audiologist that is dedicated to taking on these tinnitus patients, I mean, the really hard patients, you know, not the ones that I said, oh, I have a hearing loss and oh yeah, I notice tinnitus every so often, but the really hard ones that you are going to get calls all the time and you are going to get, you know, crying and you are going to get the frustrations and you are going to have to work with things like that. You've got to find an audiologist like that. That's going to help you get to where you need to be and help you find that particular treatment um, that's going to help you because everybody's going to be different. So that would be probably my third um, recommendation is, is to find that audiologist that has that. That's a great recommendation. And the American Tinnitus Association has professional members. And those are folks who contribute towards the tinnitus community. And on the Tinnitus Today, which is the American Tinnitus Association's journal, there's a list of providers who have basically said, 
I am a tinnitus specialist. So if there's someone in your local area that you want to work with, you could call them, try to get a sense of who they are and if they resonate with you. And then if you choose to, you can see them. That's one way to find these individuals. Yeah. Yeah. I would also put out one other resource too, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of people, I mean, in any profession, right, they can have the word tinnitus in their name of their practice or whatever it is. But you also, as a consumer and as a patient, have to be aware of um, digging deeper and doing your due diligence because finding that provider, you know, you can go off of a list, you can go off of a um, directory, but it might just be those people that have tinnitus in their, in their practice name too. So you have to do your due diligence, which means when you call that office off of that directory, whatever directory you're going on, I would ask them, um, you know, how often do they see tinnitus patients? Maybe what are the methods that they use? As well as, do you have any uh, patients that I can reach out to, to talk to about, you know, what you've done? Because I think those are, are, are super important questions to ask when you call that practice, to really weed out um, uh, the people that really are there to do tinnitus and the people that provide the service. You know, provide the service is different from really attacking that tinnitus. Um, so the other, uh, directory that I would say to look at would also be uh, TRTA, which is the Tinnitus Retraining Therapy Association. Um, uh, I think it's trta.org. Um, but it is also off of Dr. Yastrzemov's website. So Dr. Yastrzemov's website is um, tinnitus-pjj.com. And at the bottom, it's, a, it's kind of an old website. It looks clunky. But at the bottom, there is that link to the TRTA Association. Um, and those are the people that have been trained um, as well in tinnitus retraining therapy. Um, I've even had practices that, you know, their name has tinnitus, they do, um, they put themselves out as tinnitus, but they hire a lot of audiologists that have not been trained in tinnitus, but maybe the owner has done the training. So you want to make sure that, um, and the only reason why I know this is because I get a lot of patients that fly in to see me. And when I'm done with my consult, they said, nobody has ever explained tinnitus to me that way. And I said, really? Because you've been to this one particular clinic and I'm surprised. And they said, nope. Now, granted, you only can remember what you can remember, right? And so it's not necessarily always the truth, but at the same time, it hurts my heart to know that patients out there feel like they go to a pretty reputable clinic or um, an audiologist thinking that that's their solution when in fact it might not necessarily be. And so with any um, thing that you're looking into, whether it's a health related issue, do your due diligence, you might have to get a second opinion or, um, you know, if you don't have the rapport there to, to really do that, uh, that research and find a place that you can have that, that type of care. That's great advice. Put in some front end work to do some research and save some time later having to, instead of having to jump around to try different providers to find the right specialist, just do your research and you'll have the right one from the beginning. That's great. I want to spend the next few minutes, the last few minutes, talking about some of your other business endeavors, particularly your work with the entrepreneurial community and how you're the CEO of Connect for Excellence. Would you like to explain a bit about what is Connect for Excellence? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. So Connect for Excellence is a business that I have outside of audiology. And it started um, because I had the, I, I found the ability to be able to um, work with people to get them connected better to other people. And whether it is my audiology background by just being, you know, a good active listener with, with my patients or not, I started to work with entrepreneurs and businesses, startups, um, maybe businesses that were stuck. But I did four things and, and Connect for Excellence is a, if a four pillar type of uh, consulting business. And so I'm able to help people that have ideas and help them to see their vision a little bit better or to kind of get that vision um, focused in order to get their branding out. So that's kind of more of an internal thing, you know, looking inside yourself before you actually launch something. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is social media. And so I have fun on social media. I host two Facebook live shows. In fact, I, I'm thinking of hosting a third one uh, with somebody that we just finished talking about. Um, but I love connecting that way using social media. We have this form of technology like what you and I are doing even and what you're doing with the tinnitus summit um, virtually right and so we have this way of, of connecting but 
I love to be able to connect in a different way. Now, there's still that same way where you have to have, you know, eye contact, you have to show up, you have to be consistent, just like in person. You know, if you say that you're going to have a meeting with somebody, show up, show up at the time, make sure it's the right time, you know, whatever you need to do, it should be the same way as we connect virtually. So I love teaching people how to connect to their audiences on social media using those same types of models of just that behavior of connection. And then I love being involved in events, whether I hold events, host events, or I help people out with their events. I love teaching people how to connect at their event using social media, but then also within the people that are attending their events by different ideas and creative ideas. And then the fourth thing, uh, the fourth pillar would be connecting people to give back. And so I honestly believe that you know, we should all be supporting people that give back to other endeavors, whether it is nonprofit, whether it's just doing good, because there's so much in ourselves that we have positivity, you know, light that we can emanate that I want people to focus on that as a business. Like, think about that. Don't just think about, you know, making money to make money, but why are you doing this? And what can you do to to pay it forward and, and to push it onto others. And so I really think that's a huge part of a business model. And I encourage that with the businesses that I work with, as well as um, I host a podcast show called Connecting a Better World, where I highlight people doing good, whether it's a nonprofit, whether they're just volunteering, but I highlight people doing good to show people that they're just regular people like you and I doing what we're doing, but I want to get it out there. And usually the questions that I always ask on that show is, is what made you feel like you wanted to do? I want to get to the root. Was it your parents? Was it just you innately wanting to give back? And then um, we talk about what they do. And then at the end, I always say, what are, what's some advice for people who are listening to either themselves get out, out of their chair and actually give back? Because there are lots of people who see things and, and they think, huh, well, that's a good idea. You know, well, I can't do that. Well, why can't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? And so I love to, to, to get that conversation going with people to really get them to look inside of what passion they have inside in order to give back to the community so that we can make the world better. That's all I want to do. Like that is my goal is to make the world better before I leave. And that's it. So <laughs> that's what I do with Connect for Excellence. <laughs> Amazing. You are making the world better already. So another way to say that question is that we're how can we continue to make the world better? Because I see that you're already doing that. The podcast I was looking through, there's a lot of amazing interviews highlighting some people who are taking that action step of, I have had these successes. Now I'm giving back in some way, my local community, a global mission, it's wonderful work you're doing. So guys, this is Dr. Natalie Phillips, who is a doctor of audiology in Fort Collins, Colorado. And Natalie, I'm going to let you take the next few moments to say whatever you'd like, and then we'll stop the recording for this session on the Tinnitus Virtual Summit. Take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Ben, for this platform and for what you're doing, getting some experts together to really bring tinnitus to light. I think that it's, it's such a great, it, it, 50 million people have tinnitus. And so, you know, it's one of those things where people have it. They might not necessarily talk about it, but the more we talk about it, the more people are going to learn that there are other people out there, you know, wherever they are in their tinnitus journey that may have gotten that help. And that's the most important thing. And again, you know, Ben and I had talked about um, making sure you take the proper steps to find that person. And that's all I want to do here is to encourage you that if you are so frustrated with your tinnitus or sound sensitivity, you know, you don't have the answers yet keep reaching out to the people you know that you can most audiologists if they don't actually do it because the education system and how we're putting out our doctorate students you know they're teaching them a lot more about tinnitus than when i went through school um, it's something that if they don't do tinnitus themselves that more and more audiologists are passing them off to the specialists that actually do. So keep reaching out. If you had a bad experience, don't let that be your story and make sure that you keep reaching out to find that one professional who might be able to help you because you can be helped. And that's really what I want to leave with. Thanks everyone for watching the Tinnitus Virtual Summit. Take care. Thanks again, Dr. Phillips. Bye everyone. Thank